Welcome back. Yo. We're here, and we have got a another legend. legend. And another we've been legend. saying that a lot lately, but this is... A true legend. Another true legend. <laughs> he is one who, uh, we were just talking about this actually, you know, that, that this is one of the top three, bo- or the first three books that we got when we began in business. Mm-hmm. And, and this one, for sure, has infiltrated every way that we do our marketing, and how we think through marketing, and, mm-hmm. and how we're on the lookout for things. And pretty much... Much every copywriter on the planet has probably read his book. If they haven't, so. then they're probably not a copywriter <laughs> worth uh, working with. Uh, well, that's a that's a good little checkbox there. Ask your copywriter, have you read Influence? Yes. So, <laughs> yeah, we buried the lead a little bit. We were talking to Dr. Robert Cialdini, the author of Influence and Persuasion today. Right. And definitely fanboyed out on this one a little bit. He is, uh, I mean, he is the godfather of influence. And I'm not sure, I didn't make that up. I I don't even know exactly where I got that from, but he is. There's no doubt about it. So Dr. Cialdini is globally known as the foundational expert in the science of influence and how to actually apply it ethically in business. It was created for consumers, he Mm -hmm. said, but Folks in business, I mean, this is this is definitely a book you want to understand. So he, he now has seven principles. It used to be six principles in his previous version of Influence. So if you're not aware that he actually has a new version, it came out I think, a couple months ago, a few months ago, get it. It's mm-hmm. like 220 extra pages packed, reworked, re-engineered. It's way more practical. He even puts in like things to look out for the downside of these principles if someone's trying to use these on you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also a new principle called unity, which is the seventh now of his uh, original six. You know, he just built on top of that. On this episode, we're going to dive into a handful of his principles and really sort of narrow in on you know, how these are relevant and how you can use them in the digital age right now. So you are going to dig this episode because it's actually a pretty uh, useful tactical episode on how to leverage these principles in your business. Quite a bit. Yes. So um, make sure you grab the notes on this one. If you go to flowchartgroup.com, you can get access to all of the notes. You will be joining our Facebook group. But one of the questions to join the Facebook group is give us your email. You give us your email. We'll send you the action guide to this episode. So go do that at Flowchart Group. Dot com. Great. What's up, everybody? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast with your boys, Matt Wolf and Joe Fear. All righty. It's go time. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Robert Cialdini. Uh, it's, this is a pleasure. We've been, I mean, you probably hear this all the time, so it's probably, you know, a broken record, but foundation of so much of what we do reading influence your original well, you have the copy matt uh, to the left of you over there <laughs> but this expanded version has been blowing our minds in terms of how practical it is it's it feels like you've, you've expanded the practicalness of all of the principles and added another principle as well so it's, it's so fun here. well yeah. i'm glad to be with you uh and um you're right about the practical aspect. That seemed to me to be one thing that I really needed to uh, step up the game with because people want takeaways. They want to be able not just to participate in the exchange of information the way you would in a university class. Mm. They, they want to be able to employ the insights that come from that information in ways that improve their outcomes and the outcomes of the people around them. Yeah. And that, and us as uh, so we we have a primary a marketing uh, you know uh, audience here a lot of entrepreneurs and so many people reference influence in so many of their works in terms of you know copywriting or you know just just persuasive selling and things like that and we were talking about you know there's obviously an ethical portion of this as well that we should always put forefront in our minds with all the principles I'm sure most people have probably heard them but we'll do a nice recap of of all of them now seven principles. I think that makes eminent sense. Yeah, to perfect. That's a good... Do a tour through them and then highlight what's new. Before we do, um, do you mind if I ask how you actually got into the work of influence? Why did you decide to to go down this rabbit hole of studying influence? All my life, I've been a sucker. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> and. He- Easy mark for the appeals of various kinds of salespeople or fundraisers who would come to my door. And I would find myself in unwanted possession of things I did, you know, uh, that I didn't really uh, understand why that was the case. And it seemed to me, oh, wait a minute, it must be something other than the content. It must be something other than the features 
of the thing. It must be the way the features of the thing were presented to me psychologically in a compelling way that got me to move in their direction. Oh, this is worthy of study. Not just uh, for reasons of self-defense, uh, but because people would be interested in knowing the factors that incline them toward yes. Um, both when they are the um, originators of a appeal and when they're the recipients of a, an appeal and want to know not just how to generate yes, but how to deflect or reject it when somebody uses it on them in an in, um, inopportune or a, a, an undue, unwelcome way, let's say that. I know for me, it's really helped me understand some of the just the innate things I have with myself, the way I lead with my personality, uh, you know, understanding the liking principle in this book specifically, I was able to really understand a couple of times like, wow, okay. So, I mean, I think all, all of us or a lot of us, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. We have maybe some of these principles baked into us, but we don't maybe necessarily know we're doing them. And, uh, you know, we're kind of blind to our own, maybe, uh, persuasion abilities. I think that is the case. People who are successful have recognized how these principles work uh, at some level. What they often don't recognize is how to optimize them. How, steps to take that uh, really not only activate the principle, but maximize its impact in the situation. So that's what uh, I tried to do in the book to make sure that people got more than just a concept uh, uh, regarding each of the principles, but something other than that, uh, that allowed them to um, implement uh, the, the and harness the principles more successfully. Yeah, yeah. No, this is great. So, uh, you know, before we hop into the principles and dive in, because I'm sure that's the meat that most people want, um, I, I would be remiss to think that, that, you know, the technology that we all have at our fingertips right now, there's, I think it's your very last chapter. Everything's moving so quickly now, and it's probably not ever going to slow down, at least for a while, in terms of the tech, you know, the, the, the graph, uh, I think it's Moore's Law, where it's just spiking. So, you know, with that comes all these different persuasion elements mixed in through technology, social media, not just talking with people anymore. So I found that super fascinating is another reason or a benefit to really understand these and harness these now, rather than just kind of let that happen to you, even through technology. Right. I mean, information is racing. Technology is exploding. Uh, and we have to be ready to analyze and recognize what's going on inside those trends, those burgeoning uh, phenomena within the society so that we can get a good handle on them and once again um, operate on them in a way that doesn't sweep us away but that we in fact get, uh, uh, we, we hook our, our, uh, our wagons onto those, uh, those power sources that are uh, sweeping uh, the society along. Yeah. Just a little reference to this, too, is we, we chatted with B.J. Fogg uh, earlier this week, actually, and I know he, he was mentioned on the back cover, of, uh, he gave you some praise, and, and there was a cool story of him actually taking your influence principles and doing a study, I think, about 10 years ago in technology. And it's interesting now, 10 years later, you know, now people are paying attention and you're, you're writing about it as well. So it's, it's kind of a cool full circle there. <laughs> That's right. You know, uh, somebody once told me, you know, Bobby, uh, your book Influence is considered the Bible of uh, internet marketing, of digital commerce. But when you first wrote it, internet commerce didn't right. exist. How could you look ahead? How could you see all of this back then? And the truth is, I didn't look ahead. I looked inside us. What are the factors that have always been part of the human condition, that have always informed us, 
usually well as to when to say yes to a request or a proposal or a recommendation. Those factors haven't changed in the last 15 years. Those things are still part of who we are as a species and how we've evolved and how we've socialized ourselves into behaving in social interactions. Those are the things that I chronicled and put into the book, one to a chapter, the, the, the major influences on the influence process. And those have, I think, uh, stood the, the test of time because the platforms can change, the vehicles of delivery can change, but the motivations to say yes in order to do well in a situation, those things have stayed the same for us as a species. Yeah. When you wrote the book, did you know set aside internet marketing? Did you see it being used as a, as sort of a bible for marketers? You know, not necessarily internet marketing. Just did was it written in a way that you thought marketers would take it and use these strategies in their marketing? No, the opposite. I wrote it for the consumer. Mm -hmm. How to recognize and resist and deflect these principles when they are used on us in unethical ways. Um, but guys, no consumer group has ever called me. <laughs> but my phone hasn't stopped ringing. My internet hasn't stopped lighting up with requests from people who say, you know, I... I I would like to harness these principles. I'd like to to make them part of the way that I do business ethically mm -hmm. that lends itself to a better outcome for all concerned. And so over the additions I've shifted to the uh uh to the implementation mm -hmm. again, ethical implementation right. of these levers of influence. Well, let's let's get into the principles, I'm sure folks really want to hear it from you and not <laughs> us skating around them. So, you know, you have the original six. Were those always the original? I know Matt has the uh, the previous version to this. They were always they were. the original. I, I, I just counted six. And by the way, the way I did it was not to sit in my um, office at a university and just read all the literature on... Um, experiments and uh, studies that have been done, but to actually infiltrate the training programs of as many influence professions as I could get access to. I entered the training programs of various kinds of sales organizations. I learned how to sell insurance from an office. I learned how to sell portrait photography over the phone. I learned how to sell nu nutritional supplements door to door. Uh, and uh, I didn't stop there. I also infiltrated uh, the training programs of uh, charity organizations. How do the fundraisers, what do they say? What do they do? I did the same thing for recruiters, uh, I, the same thing for public relations specialists. And I tried to see what was in common across all of these professions dedicated to getting others to say yes. And I only counted six things. I was shocked uh, by the small footprint that I found when I looked at the universals, the things that appeared in every profession taught to every practitioner. You need to do this in order to be more successful. We've found that. Well, so these folks, you know, had done a much grander experiment than I could ever have done in <laughs> <Right>. my laboratory, <laughs> you know, studying uh, behaviors of, uh, of subjects in, in, in uh, some kind of a uh, experiment. There was a, ex an experiment that was going on for decades in all kinds of professions, and the th there were only six things that rose to the surface wow. in each that were instructed by the trainers do this because this leads to assent say this give yourself 
this image or that kind of phrasing or wording and you get more assent. That's the biggest surprise that I got. Yeah, no, that's it's fascinating. I know, yeah, all the un undercover work, and he took sabbaticals to do all this stuff. So you were, you know, boots on the ground. You were out there getting dirty and seeing it firsthand. And I think that's super fascinating. So walk us through. Uh, do you have a? Are they in order? Would that would that be the best way to present these, or do you like to kind of pick and choose? You know, I have now put them in order. Okay. Um, it previously because they weren't. They didn't occur in some sort of lockstep sequence where you needed to do this in order to do the next and then the next. Um, I never gave them a particular sequencing, but uh, that's changed now because my colleague, Dr. Gregory Neidert, has developed his uh, core motives model of social influence in which he says there are three... Um, basic motives, motivations um, that people use to decide whether to say yes. The first set involve um, getting people to, f to like us, getting people to feel bonded with us, to feel a positive association with us. That's the first step. Uh, if you don't have that, you're probably not going to go yeah, very yeah. far with any of the others. Uh, and so uh, principles like reciprocation, giving first, principles like liking, principles like the new one that I've come to, the seventh one called unity, the sense of belonging together within, in a category with a, another person. Those things should be established first and so that's the first set that i i talk about then after that if you've got that established a, a good rapport then the question is how do we reduce the uncertainty people have about whether to move in our direction uh, and whether this is the time to do it well, there are two others that really reduce uncertainty and satisfy that particular motive for our audiences. One is what we call social proof, the extent to which uh, evidence exists that a lot of others like us are doing this thing that we're recommending, uh, that, that as communicators we're recommending to our audience. Um, that reduces uncertainty. If we see a lot of people doing it, just like us, that they've beta tested it. They're, they've already uh, d determined uh, that this is something that makes sense for them to do. And if they're like us, it makes sense for us to follow. Uh, second is authority. Uh, if the experts are all saying that this is the right move to take or we can show testimonials from people who are knowledgeable and legitimate authorities on a topic, um, once again, it reduces our audience members' uncertainty that what we have to offer is a good thing for them. So then you get uncertainty re reduced. And then finally, there's a third uh, motivation that we have to be sure that we, um, that we engage. And that is to get people to act. It's not enough to get them to like us and even to get them to reduce their uncertainty about uh, you know, uh, whether what we have is a good thing. Um, I can like uh, the, the guy at the gym who uh, trains me and I can reduce my uncertainty that going to the gym is a good thing. <laughs> that doesn't get sure. me up in the morning. <laughs> Always. Right? You need something else to get you going, to get you moving in that direction. And there are two things that get people mobilized into action. One, two other principles. One is commitment and consistency. If we make a public, effortful, uh, visible, and internal commitment to something, right, where we take a stand, go on record, publicize our belief in a particular thing, we're much more likely to take action that's congruent with that 
right? So, oh yeah, so yes, I've gone on record. I've told my my, my family members. I've told my friends. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna lose five pounds. I'm gonna get to the gym. If I've said that, it makes it much more likely that I'll actually undertake that action. And then the 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 last one is scarcity. If there if these opportunities are rare or scarce or dwindling in availability, that gets me moving. That gets me taking a step so that I don't lose those uh, scarce uh, opportunities that may be gone if I don't take that step. So those are the three stages in which we now present uh, the material in the book, although I have taken the unity principle because it's the the new one. I have put that at the end, uh, but I, I, I characterize it in terms of one of those things that builds a sense of, of connection to others that makes them feel that um, we're, we've got a togetherness thing going here. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm, I'm curious if there's any one of those seven principles that you find people misinterpret often or use in completely an unintended way than the way you meant it. Yes. Um, there are, there's, there's a couple actually, uh, but the first is authority and people often think that means being in charge or being the boss, being in authority. All right. Yeah. You can get people to move in your direction. That's power. That's what I consider power, hierarchical power. Mm -hmm. You can coerce people, you can twist their arms, you can bribe them, you can punish them. I mean, there are all those things that is available to somebody in the hierarchy who can, who, who can change your outcomes. But I'm really talking about not being in authority, I'm talking about being an authority. Mm -hmm somebody who is seen as knowledgeable, experienced, is credentialed, that doesn't require any twisting of arms. People want to go in the direction of the voice of authority who is, after all, wise and experienced in this uh, arena. Uh, that's what we're really talking about there. And people often uh, make that mistake. Mm -hmm. Another is uh, commitment and consistency, where uh, people say, you know, so what that means is I need to show people that I am consistent in my message, right? I'm committed to this message and I am uh, congruent with it in all the aspects of my marketing plan or how I, uh, how I present myself and so on. That is important. I don't doubt that. But that's not what we're talking about. What we're really talking about is a desire inside our audience members to be consistent within themselves, within what they have said or done previously. So that if we can get somebody, arrange for people to take a step in our direction, that will, in order to be consistent with what they have now already done, they will be significantly more likely to take another step in our direction in order to, to stay consistent with the position uh, that they've publicly made, taken. Yeah. So those two things we often have to sort of, um, uh, debrief to people who have uh, uh, thought about them differently. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I want to go back to authority really quick because that one uh, stood out when I, I heard you on uh, some podcast. We were doing deep research and all this fun stuff. And you broke down authority as, I believe it was expertise and trustworthiness. And, you know, the expertise kind of stands for itself. It's the credentials. It's the stuff that people kind of say about you. Uh, but I was really curious about the trustworthy part of that, you know, that element. Could you break that down and some of these elements that, that really make up authority? Yes. And the, so uh, what we found uh, in research around the world, by the way, in uh, 
Korea, in Japan, in Sweden, in the United Kingdom, in Canada, in the United States, all the research shows the same thing. There's one particular kind of authority that if you have in the minds of your audience, no one can beat you as a communicator. It's to be a credible authority. And what a credible authority possesses is these two elements that you just mentioned, Joe. One is expertise, right? knowledge, um, and, um, and that sort of background of experiences, right? So you're knowledgeable. The other is trustworthiness, that this expert information you're providing is being offered in a way that's designed to accurately depict reality. It's not designed to, to line your own pockets or um, uh, get a profit. It's designed to honestly inform people of the true state of affairs. If you've got those two, that's as good as you can get as an expert communicator. No one, all other things equal, can beat you if you've got those. So we talk in uh, you know, our programs and in the book about how you present yourself so that you're not seen as yeah. boastful, uh, braggart, and so on, but people recognize your true uh, expertise in the area. Um, and also how you generate a perception of trustworthiness. So let's take a couple of those two in turn. Uh, it, one thing you have to remember is that uh, you're going to be seen negatively if you're a broker of positive information about yourself in a face-to-face -face interaction. I couldn't sit down in front of you guys and say, before we begin, let me, remi let you remind let me remind you of how great I really am. <laughs> that feels so good. No, yeah. it goes against all the rules. You can't do it, right? So you ha it has to precede you. It has to come in written form in a, uh, a, 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 a an email that you send, uh, giving people a link to your LinkedIn page and so on. Uh, or you get somebody else who knows both of you to send that message about your expertise and uh, accomplishments and how successful you were in helping mm. him or her. Right? That kind of evidence is really much more successful than you trying to promote your, your own uh, uh, yeah. qualities. Okay. So one of the things, for example, we once did a study um, in a hospital of stroke patients who were given, um, a, when they left the hospital after they had uh, you know, been treated, uh, they were given home exercise programs, uh, regimens to do by the physical therapists. And what when they would come back to be evaluated every uh, uh, so often, it was clear they weren't doing their exercises. And so the hospital administrators asked us to go interview those people and, and see what the problem was. And they said, you know, we know what the background and experience and credentials of our doctors are, right? They've got their <laughs> diplomas on the walls. But the physical therapy staff, we didn't know anything about their expertise. Well, it turns out those people were very well credentialed. So all we did was to have the physical therapy staff put in a little, there was a little room where they gave people the, um, the regimens and explained how they should do these home exercises. We had them put all of their credentials, their diplomas, their certificates, their accreditations on the wall. We got 31% better 
exercise wow. compliance. Just from showing people rather than telling them about our expertise and authority. So that's one thing that's a, a nuance there. The other thing which is I think even trickier is um, trustworthiness. How do you show people that you're being honest with them? You're not providing some biased view of the uh, uh, of the situation to in you know enhance your own outcomes you're really leveling with them and what most of the training programs i engage uh, i infiltrated uh, told us is that well this is going to take a while to become the um the trustworthy advisor for people, the person that they automatically assign trustworthiness to after you've dealt with them for weeks or months or years. If you've been a straight shooter, that perception surfaces. It just evolves. Well, true. But what if you don't have weeks or months or longer? What if you're what if you're dealing with somebody for the first time? You are being altogether straight with them. You're really trying to maximize their interests in the situation with this expert information that you're providing them. How do you get them to see that? It's there. It's really in there. How do you do it? It turns out there's a small practice, a small technique a small change that you can employ that produces instant trustworthiness. But it requires that you go against everything that you've been told to do in a sales or marketing interaction. Very intriguing. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. What we've always been told to do is you begin with your strongest suit. You provide all the evidence that moves people in your direction based on your, your, your most compelling argument, your most attractive feature, the thing that most differentiates you from all your competitors in a positive way. You, you begin, and then, because all cases have strengths and weaknesses, after you've got people leaning in your direction, you mention a weakness in your case. You mention, you know, this we're, we're, we might be a little more expensive than our uh, competitors, or what I'm suggesting may take a little longer to produce the results that you are interested in, or the tax consequences may take a while to, uh, to make themselves shown, right? You say that at the end. And that's a mistake. If these people don't know you, don't know about your credibility, don't know about your truthfulness, why should they believe your strongest arguments when you present them? They're not ready yet. Those arguments are going to bounce off this wall of doubt that they have about you. You've got to bring the wall down. And the way to do it is to mention that weakness or that drawback in your case early, not the first thing. You don't sit down and say, before we begin, let me tell you all the things that are wrong with me, my organization, our products and services. No. But be relatively early, you own the drawback. You tell them, here's the thing that you, I do need to tell you about. What that does is to immediately make you the most powerful authority communicator we have ever found in, in uh, behavioral science research. It makes you knowledgeable in their eyes because you've just shown them, I know not just the pluses, I know the, 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 the minuses too. Yeah, and we're not trying to hide them. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. and that's the credibility part, the, the trustworthy. I'm, and 
I'm not trying to pull a blanket of positivity over your eyes. I'll tell you the strengths and the weaknesses right up front. Okay, now, here's the key. After you've mentioned that weakness, you say the word, but. And you use it as a bridge to now mentioning your strongest argument, your most positive feature, because they will be processing it more deeply and believing it more fully now because you've demonstrated your credibility. And everything you say now that's positive gets incorporated at a different level because it's coming from a credible source, right? But the key is the word but, or you could use however, or nonetheless, or at the same time. I have a friend who is a, a psycholinguist. She studies the psychology of language. She said, do you know what the word but signifies in every human language to the recipient of that word? It says to that person, take what I've just told you and put it away. Don't think about it now. Think about the next thing. Focus on the next thing I'm about to say. That's the place for your strongest argument. Immediately after you've mentioned a weakness and bridged to a strength that wipes away the weakness, just knocks it off its pins because this strength is so overpowering compared to that weakness right <laughs> it, it, it sort of reminds and i could be on the wrong track here and i'm sure you'll correct me if i'm wrong but it sort of reminds me of like the the old p90x ads where they would come out with the ad and the ad would be like this is going to be really hard you're going to have to have discipline it's going to be a lot of work you're going to hate it but you're going to have the best body of your life and feel better than you've ever felt right and that was sort of the p90x marketing exactly right you can go back further <laughs> you guys aren't old enough to remember i remember there was an ad campaign that Avis mm -hmm. um, rental car ran back in the 70s and 80s. Um, it went like this. When they were uh, the distant second place uh, uh, provider to Hertz, they said, we're number two, but mm -hmm. we try harder. They got a 700% increase in market share in one year. More recently, L'Oreal, um, you know, in, in, famous cosmetics provider, had an ad that went like this. L'Oreal, we're expensive, but you're worth it. 300% increase in market share during the, the duration of that campaign, right? So this works. It's powerful. Yeah, that does. It, it, it's like the, the two parts. There's the human element where you're humanizing yourself or your brand in a way and pointing out the flaws or potential uh, objections in someone's mind. And then there's like that reset with the butt. It's like a mental reset, but that stuff still conditioned somehow in, you know, it seems like it's anchored, you know, you're anchoring the human element and then all of a sudden you get them with the, the next statement. And, you know, a lot of the time, because your rivals have done this job for you or the, your, your audience members have done their research, they know the weakness. They know that you're the more expensive. What, by bringing it up, the, yourself you give them something they didn't know that you're honest yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you're a credible source <laughs> of information from your mouth not someone else right. yeah. <laughs> so you haven't lost anything it's not like you've given them some sort of reason not to move in your direction they already had it yeah. you've just given them a reason to move in your direction because 
because you're a straight shooter. <laughs> It's kind of funny. I'm just thinking of the course of this podcast for us. Like we have these, we've had therapy sessions. That's when him and I, Matt and I are alone kind of talking about the flaws, the struggles, and then we're talking about what we're thinking about. But I feel like that it, it's gotten easier over time to almost get into that habit similar to this format that you're saying here. And it, I don't know, it just, it, there's a more of a, a bond overall. I know we've heard it from our audience and it's, I just feel like it's a little bit freer uh, in our language to share yeah. the weaknesses and then follow it up. We've with. all got them. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> so might as well lay them out there in the right yeah. spot. <laughs> I want to I dig in on, on, on the scarcity principle for a minute, too, because I feel like the scarcity principle in the, the sort of digital landscape we're in is one of the principles that I feel is used in one of the more icky kind mm. of ways a lot of times. You see a lot of uh, stuff online where – uh, you know, maybe it's a digital ebook, but they're saying, you know, only 200 left. So buy now, or you see these landing pages where they have a countdown timer. And then the next day you go back to the site and the countdown timers just reset again. And you see all these people trying to like right. fake the scarcity to manipulate people to buy. Right. And so I'm curious if, if there is no real scarcity, like, like a digital product, a software ebook, something like that, how do you implement scarcity in those sorts of situations? You do it by showing how you are unique that you have something that none of your rivals have and your audience can't have them can't get them unless they move in your mm -hmm. direction right now a lot of times that's not one thing it's a suite of things a particular combination that only you provide right that should be at the top of your presentation right the scarcity the uniqueness the uncommonness the thing that people can't get if they don't move in your direction and it makes people crazy not to be able to get something that they want so if you you know make that point Here's how I do it. But also, you can do it with uh, campaigns where you can say, you know, we've got this uh, special uh, feature or bonus only for the following period of time that we can provide it, or we only have X number that, that include that, this feature or this particular bonus. There was a study done of 6,000... 700 online marketing sites and the a b tests that they did to examine the effect of certain features inside those tests inside those sites to produce conversions and some of the features were um tech, were like uh economic uh providing free uh delivery some were technological. Is there a search function on the site that allows people easy access to the materials? Uh, some of them were, were uh, persuasive. Uh, is there a call to action line at the end of every appeal? Those kinds of things. And they had 29 of them that they looked at. The, tops, the top set were the principles of influence. <laughs> Those things didn't matter as much as scarcity or social proof or authority or consistent commitment and consistency. Now, of those principles, scarcity was at the top. Hmm. Online, telling people that there's a limited supply or a limited uh, period of time in which to move gets them off the fence. And it seems like in, in the list, I like how you prioritized earlier the principles. And I've, I'm, I'm kind of look, I marked them down. And scarcity was the last one, I believe you said there, out of all of them. And it's like, that's, yeah, that just kind of pushes them over the line or like the last motivator, it seems like. But there's. For those people right. who are still dithering. You know, for sitting on the fence, they're standing on the sidelines. They, you just can't get them into the game. They like you. They like your products. and But they don't move. Scarcity 
mobilizes yeah, them into action. So, yeah, take a look at the other principles and maybe you know layer those in prior to going into scarcity. Absolutely. The, yeah, the next most powerful was social proof, this idea that if a lot of other people like me are doing this and they show evidence of you know uh, other people buying and the uh, number of five-star ratings we've got and all this kind of thing, that's the second most powerful. But there's some new research, by the way. Suppose you're a, a startup or you have a brand new model and you don't have a lot of ratings yet. You don't have a lot of market share. You don't have a lot of purchases yet, but you've got a good product. But it's only like 15 percent, uh, you know, uh, are, are moving in your direction and you you want much more of the market than that. If you show them a trend to 15%, they project that into the future. Aha. Consistency, right? Right, consistency. So even if you don't have the majority on your side yet, most people doing this, if you show that there's a, a trajectory in that direction, people will be more persuaded by that piece of information than simply the 15%. The 15% actually could take them away from you. They'll say, oh, that I can do the, the arithmetic. That means 85% are not yeah. moving in, right? But if they see that movement, that growth, and here's what I'm going to recommend. When you give them the evidence of a trend, give them three data points. Don't just say six months ago it was 5%, now it's 15%. Because it could be that three months ago it was 25% and it's down to 15% right. at six, right? Right. No, say Six months ago, it was 5%. Three months ago, it was 10%. Today, it's 15%. Give them three data points, which is, allows you to then use a very powerful piece of phrasing. And that is to say, not just more people are moving in our direction, but to say, more and more people are moving in my that's three points more is five to ten and another more that's another jump more and more greater and greater better and better larger and larger three data yeah. points if you've got the data honestly We'd be fools of the influence process if we didn't s set them out to show people the direction and the growth that's occurring. Yeah. Well, and it seems like that, that growth, too, could also create some implied scarcity. Like, you want to get in now because look at the trajectory. Like, mm. do you want to get in here or do you want to get in up here? So it almost sort of marries well to, so, uh, to the scarcity principle as well. Yeah, that's that's an excellent sure. point. Well, and and it actually strikes a bell for unity for me as well. It's like, do you want to be part of the cool kids, the <laughs> in group, the the we? <laughs> that's right. You want to be part of the early adopters who really understand and are benefiting before everybody sure. else. Yeah. I I think unity is so fascinating in that sense because there's a lot of it. I think in just society these days, we're seeing it all over the place. I mean, from you know, the health stuff with COVID, of course, politics, but business. And and we just said early adopters. That's a wave of people. That's people identify as early adopters. So they're out buying the stuff. Right. And right. so yeah, speak a little bit more on unity because this is the newest principle. So what what sparked unity as making it into the book as one of the, the seven now principles? You know, part of it was just looking at what's happening in society right now that, that we we are tribalizing, we're balkanizing, we're, we're finding ourselves in membership groups that we I, use to identify who we are. And that 
identity, if it is shared by someone else, really causes us to feel very positively toward that person, to want to cooperate with that individual, to trust that person more, to agree with that person more, and the research shows to say yes to that person more. So it really does deserve something separate from mere similarity. So for example, one of the things we say produces liking is just being showing people that you have similar tastes or preferences or styles uh, you know that that you 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 like this is not about similarity as much as it is about belonging together that i am of this um group that this person shares an identity with and uh as a consequence uh, here's an example from a study that was done on a university campus, but outside on the campus, uh, researchers had a young woman about college age, dressed like a college student would, right. stand on a heavily trafficked uh, part of campus and ask for donations to a good cause. I think it was the United Way. And she was getting some kind of uh, response. But if for half of the people who passed by, she added one more sentence to the request. The sentence was, I'm a student here too. I'm one of you. Donations increased by 450%. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's unity. This isn't something small. No. This is a big lever of influence. So, where you have ide shared identities, they can be local identities, members of the same community, for example, or neighborhood, or uh, you know, even in in the Olympics, the nation. Sure. You know, when when we're against the others and we're Americans, that we really wanted those people to win. Mm -hmm. So anyway, those those um, those shared identities, those senses of um, shared belonging make a big difference in whether people say yes to us or not. Do you do you think there's going to be any additional principles added in the future, or do you think it's pretty locked in at seven? Are there like other things that you're you're, you're sort of paying attention to? I'm not going to say <laughs> no to the possibility, but it took a long time for me to figure out that. The, the principle of unity was really a separate principle. Mm. It wasn't just something that undergirded the success of all the others. That if you had unity, then scarcity would work better for you and, and social proof would work better. No, no, this was, you could take it away from all the others and it would be by itself powerful. Yeah. Was there, so we had some questions from our community and uh, this is from a gentleman, Larry Ludwig. He's been on our show too. And, and he asked, you know, did you ever expect your book or oh, this whole body of work, everything you've done since at least what, 1984, I think was your first published year. Right? Yeah. Did you expect it to be as popular as it has become? I could not have sensibly imagined this. I, I just couldn't have First of all, at that time, there were no books that translated behavioral science for the larger non-academic audience. They just didn't exist. And I know the reason why. There's a quote from a British um, uh, legal scholar, uh, James Boyle, his name is, he said, you have never heard true condescension until you've heard an academic pronounce the word popularizer. <laughs> we were all afraid that if we wrote for a popular audience, we would be seen as watering down our insights and our our. our information and making it pablum and you know uh, pandering to the lowest denominator so 
I never thought that this would have, it would catch on the way it did. But now there's an entire um, literary category called popular behavioral science, where there are books all the time that are being published, and they're lovely. You know, they give us as a discipline, behavioral science, a chance to pay back the non-academic community that has paid for our research. <laughs> Let's be honest. Where, where do we get the funds for that research? It's from your tax dollars. Good point. Yeah. Or your donate donations to, to our universities. That's how we... we Gotta be, yeah. We're obligated to give back the information that we found out with your money. <laughs> to you thank right? you for doing that so, yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that's it's it's fascinating because yeah i did hear bits of that story and how you know it was i, I don't know if taboo is the right word but yeah it was kind of just an internal dialogue all these reports passed among you know different folks researching and the outside world was not aware as much well, with the real science behind behavior and and all, it's fascinating it's interesting how it's developed over the years and I'm sure it will continue with technology and the implications and all these different things happening. Right. Ah, no. Oh. No, this is this has been amazing. I'm yeah. honestly, I'm I'm sort of pinching myself that we even get to have this conversation with you because you know you have been such a big part of our our journey. You know that this book is something we reference constantly, and um, this is a, a surreal moment for us. So I just want to you know show my appreciation and thank you for taking the time with us today. Well, guys, I have to say I I enjoyed it thoroughly. I'm happy you did. <laughs> That's always our goal with these things anyway. We got to make them lighthearted, fun, and, and very you know practical for folks. Right. So. Is there anywhere yeah. um, that, that's a, a best place to send people to go grab the book, or should they just go to Amazon? What's the best way? The best place to go, well, Amazon is, of course, or one of the booksellers, Barnes & Nobles, or wherever. Mm -hmm. uh, but to, to get a, a, if there's a single place where you can get the most information about what we are, what we do, um, it's influenceatwork.com. You can find information about our training programs, uh, our online uh, uh, seminars, um, our books, um, our consulting, and so on. Anything that you would be interested in to know more about behavioral science, the behavioral science of influence, that's a good place to start. Perfect. Influence at work.com. So everybody needs to go check that out. Definitely. And, um, and grab the new copy, even if you have all the previous <laughs> versions. Definitely. I think it's an extra, what, 220 pages in here. That's right. And it's been. Two well, here's the difference. I've got both copies. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So it is worth every every ounce of energy and, and, and effort you put into reading and applying the principles because they work. They're fabulous. So thank you very much again. It's been a pleasure. So long for now. So that was a legend that Should we, we just a had a, con a conversation with. <laughs> yeah, man. Let's that act was... like we, let's act like we just had that conversation, even though we're wearing different clothes. <gasps> We've been <No>. marinating. <laughs> We've been thinking about it, and yeah. So Robert Cialdini, man, what a legend! Super dang cool. Yeah, yeah it was just a pleasure to have him on here. I mean, it's just a super big honor, and yeah, you know, we we've said that to him, and it's like. Ah, <laughs> like I don't know. It's like I feel like that's not even a good enough word for it because like he's been the foundation of how we think through marketing. Yeah, well, since the beginning. Yeah, when when we got into marketing, entrepreneurship, whatever you want to call the rabbit hole we went down thirteen or so years ago, I would say like it was in the one of the first three books mm -hmm. that was recommended that we read. Rich Dad Poor Dad was the the first one. Yep. I remember that, and then I think we read like Four Hour Work Week. That was in there, and then Influence was probably the very next book after those two that we got introduced to because the first the first two, Rich Dad Poor Dad and uh, Four Hour Work Week, are kind of like, look, here's what's possible. I feel like that was the mental shift. Yeah, that, that was the mental needed. shift of like, look, here's what's possible. Here's yeah. what your life could be. Yeah, right. That's what that's what those two books were, and we went, okay, let's let's strive for this mm -hmm. the very next book we picked up was influence yeah and that's where we're like okay cool so now we know what we want to do like what we're interested in how to actually kind of do it mentally mm -hmm. now here are the principles on how to execute whatever it is we're going to put out into the world and get attention and get that yes because that's what he's all about yeah he's, he's getting the ethical yes i mean mm -hmm. so that was the big thing you know that before starting this interview with robert robert cialdini it's 
you know, making it very clear that you can use these for good and bad reasons, of course, you know, mm -hmm. persuasion. So he's a massive proponent of being ethical, of course, with all the principles. And now there's a seventh principle mm -hmm. added into the mix, the unity principle. So, um, yeah, definitely get get the new version of influence. So you, you can find it on, you know, on Amazon, all the, all the places out there. They're out there. Yeah. But it's way more practical, I would say. I mean, the previous ones were amazing, but this one is just like deep dive into like, here's how to do it. Here's how to even look out for like the red flags. Mm -hmm. We didn't really talk about that in the episode, but he has sections in every chapter. Yeah. Well, he's got a website, influenceatwork.com too. So you can check mm -hmm. that out. I believe there's... Um, I think you can get the, the book links. through that site yeah. and all the links are available there as well. But yeah, I mean, if it, if it sounded like we were fanboying out a little bit on that episode, we were, it's cause we were like, he was a very influential person in our lives and <laughs> we got to speak to him and that is freaking awesome. We're not going to lie. <laughs> Wouldn't you fan girl or fanboy as well? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, so what stood out? Cause I know we both have pages of notes in our own way and I don't even know where to start. I know we, we lined out all of the principles. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And we kind of like pick and chose. We picked a few. Yeah and, yeah. and I feel like we kind of honed in on the ones that are like, uh, sort of more relevant that, that you hear a lot of the mm -hmm. internet marketers talk about. Like for me, the scarcity one is one where I, you know, I even said it to him. Like, I feel like people use scarcity in like a fairly unethical way. Like when you mm -hmm. go and see like, oh, there's only a hundred available. Well, it's a software, it's an ebook. Mm -hmm. Like, no, that's BS. You can duplicate this code to as many people as you want. There is no physical limitation for you to be able to get uh, give it to people right yeah. so that feels a little bs when people say limited quantities on a digital product and then people use this sort of time scarcity the countdown scarcity mm -hmm. all the time and the but you see it where like you land on a page the countdown ends you come back to the same page the next day the countdown just started over again like mm. that just feels gross yeah, yeah right and so i wanted to i wanted to get his opinion on that because obviously those things didn't exist when he first wrote the book there no. was no like only a hundred ebooks available there was no uh like automated countdown timers on you know on web pages like that stuff wasn't a thing when mm -hmm. he put this book out here so i was kind of curious about his thoughts now that the digital marketer world has taken it and run with it and are using his principles but mm -hmm. they're almost sort of like using his principles in a way that's like yeah that just doesn't feel right yeah yeah it's it's very possible i mean now it's so even so much easier to do that because tools are made not for that purpose of unethical reasons but again just like any tool you know like uh things like countdown timer let's mm -hmm. say you know like our our buddy out there jack Bourne, who created J uh, countdown timer there's online funnel yeah uh, deadline funnel. Yeah. <laughs> what did I say? Countdown. Oh, I, oh yeah. <laughs> deadline funnel. Duh. <laughs> Sorry, Jack. Because mm -hmm. um, I know you listen as well. And I know, you know, Jack, he's a big proponent of, of ethical, massively scarcity. E ethical sca scarcity. And that's the thing is like every tool, just like these persuasion principles from Cialdini, you know, there's always a, a downside. So yeah. it's, it's good to be aware of them, but also it's good to be able to spot these in mm -hmm. action. Yeah. Some are a little bit more obvious like those. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's just, it's, kind of icky you know yeah, like yeah. you were saying so. yeah and and you know the new book that he just put out he did update it to talk about the digital marketing mm -hmm. world so it is stuff that he has he he is covering in the new book oh, yeah. is like how these it, like these things apply yeah in that world for sure um we also had the opportunity to to ask some questions from the audience on this episode which we don't do on every episode but we feel, felt like cialdini would be a good one to do it so i actually want to we got some in there we didn't name everyone because it was kind of like some of them were molded into the questioning yeah of some things. of them he answered without us even needing to ask because right. they were sort of baked into other questions but i, I think it'd be yeah. kind of cool to shout out the people that asked the questions for sure yeah well actually i know one of the the questions that were answered i think by cialdini was uh from our our buddy Angelo Cisco, he mm -hmm. was he was asking something around like the you know basically how to use it ethically and not ethically you know mm -hmm. like the the downsides of it but mm -hmm. you know we kind of I think we started off kind of talking about that but a couple other I'll just shout out some names here Alex Tucker asked uh you know he had a question for him uh, Larry Ludwig we actually asked that one we got to get that one that one and it's basically like hey did you expect how popular this book would be or become yeah and and did you expect it to like be picked up and ran with by the marketing by the industry? marketers everywhere because yeah. like he didn't write it as a book I mean basically his answer was he didn't write it as yeah. a book for marketers he wrote it as a yeah. a book to learn how to um, avoid being influenced by others. Mm -hmm. The consumer side. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So a couple other folks that, and I think there were more questions, but I have them in front of me. Joshua Emanuel uh, asked a couple great questions and then Julie Hood. So 
thank you all. You gave us some some uh, some inspiration there, and we got to kind of sneak in some of these. Not yeah. So them, hopefully, but. hopefully uh, throughout the course of that conversation, your your questions got answered. But we really appreciate mm-hmm. you asking them. We're gonna do more stuff like that where uh, we we want to sure. you know hear what you want to hear from people all the um, time. That's yeah. what the community is there for. So. Uh, definitely share your thoughts on these episodes, uh, share your questions when uh-huh. we tell you we have guests coming up and we'll do our best to work them in. Oh yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot to debrief on this one, man, but, uh, I, I would say get the book and, and start to think about like there, I guess a couple things that stand out is the unity principle. I'm mm-hmm. seeing that pop up more and more in, in just like society in general. Like mm-hmm. we talked about it with, uh, you know, with Josh Bartlett, actually we mm-hmm. had a call after Cialdini and we're just kind of like, you know, it's interesting to see the groups of people and how, you know, decisions are made and how interactions happen Mm -hmm. when you have this kind of like we-ness is like what, uh, that's what we-ness. There's two words. There's a dash. (laughs) So, um, but it's like this, this group Well, isn't a we-ness like really like your elbow? Yeah, your elbow. (laughs) That's true. It's just a funny word. I like it. So, but like really understanding it is like, it's interesting because it, you kind of look at things a little differently. You can, I mean, that's all these principles. You start to almost see the matrix maybe a little bit when yeah. you start to understand these seven principles now. Well, the, the, the unity principle, one company that I feel like is been doing it fairly decently is ClickFunnels. If you mm-hmm. look at ClickFunnels, mm-hmm. they built, uh, they, they essentially built a tribe of people that go, I'm a funnel hacker, right? They, they yeah. created an event, Funnel Hacker Live. If you buy ClickFunnels, they send you a shirt that says, I'm a funnel mm-hmm. hacker. They send you stickers that say, I'm a funnel hacker. You're in the tribe You're now. now in the <laughs> funnel hacker tribe, right? That's mm-hmm. the unity principle at work. If everybody feels like they're all part of the same tribe, when somebody in that tribe that they relate to as being part of the tribe tries to sell you something, it the, the barrier to buying is a lot mm-hmm. easier. Mm -hmm. right you you actually see it sort of culturally a lot too you see it with like um like a like an asian family who's Mm -hmm. going to buy a new house a lot of times you see they go and find like a a, a, like an asian real estate Mm -hmm. um realtor like you see that kind of thing happen a lot where Mm -hmm. where people will go and work with like the companies or like the um the professionals that sort of fit into that community that they see themselves as a part of. Yeah. Right. It's a likeness between groups. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like languages the same way. Uh, Interests. uh, You into music? Oh, I'm into music. I mean, like literally we bonded over music when you and I met Mm -hmm. for the first time. So, I mean, there was already, you know, some kind of commonalities there. So it's just one less thing to gain trust Mm -hmm. with the people around you. But then you start to look at it, you're like, yeah, when you're outside of the group, obviously there's different things to work in. Yeah. You know, it's it's very interesting. So definitely studying the unity principle since it is the newest one. And there's he obviously had really good reason to put it in the book uh, is, is one to understand. I think yeah. it's, and it's timely too. And with technology, there's probably a lot more of this unity thing happening because we all have Facebook groups. Oh, are you mm-hmm. in the group? Oh, you're not in the group. Mm. Oh, we got to ban him from the group. Yeah. It's like now we all control our these groups. Like we all have the ability to create a following of some sort, a brand around that following, uh, you know, language that's used within that group. Well, we talked about – um, we talked about – we had an episode uh, not too long ago about all about branding and mm-hmm. how like Apple is using branding and yeah. um, and all that sort of thing. And that that's the unity principle like in play like perfectly, right? Mm. Like – um, people identify as an Apple user or an Apple hater, yeah, right? And sure. if you identify Deeply. as an Apple user and all of the, the sort of things that come with being an Apple user, it's a lot easier to sell you Apple products. For sure. Right? Or hate on Apple if you're a Samsung, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, in their case. Well, in, in that case, there was Apple lovers and Apple haters. It yeah. wasn't Apple lovers and Samsung lovers. It was like it was Apple, haters. Yeah. It was like a, like a kind of a binary thing. You either love sure. Apple or you hate Apple. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was interesting. And then the other thing that we touched on that I, I think you and I both kind of found, found fascinating because it's something we sort of unconsciously have been doing. Mm was the, the whole trustworthiness thing, right? Where when you're gonna go sell something, mm-hmm. um, Ben Settle used to call this making the skeletons dance, right? You, you, oh, you yeah. present the, the the sort of negative things first, uh, then they yeah. trust you yeah. because, oh, you just showed me the bad stuff and then you showed me the good stuff. Dude, that was so good. Right, yeah. and so like there's a there's a scene, and I think I've referenced it in the podcast before, but if you've ever watched 8 Mile, uh-huh. like the uh-huh. basically the, the sort of kind of biographical story of Eminem, right? Like, at the end, he does this rap battle, and he steps up, and his very first, like, rap battle, he steps up, he basically disses himself. Mm -hmm. Like, he sings all of this stuff about, like, you know, I'm I'm short, I'm white, I 
blah 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 like I'm, I'm poor whatever he he raps about like all of the negative stuff in his life so he takes that power away from the person mm-hmm. that he's battling yeah. right so now that when when it goes to the other person's turn the guy's like i have nothing to rip on people, <laughs> right but that's that's kind of like a, a similar like well, that's Andy's obviously not a the... trustworthiness thing but it's a i think it's, there's a good analogy there of like well, it actually, it's a perfect analogy because that's under the authority principle is mm-hmm. is the trustworthy. That's one of the components. The other one was expertise. Yeah. So, and I guess in the M M&M and M example there, like he's he's basically authoritating him. He's establishing authority with the audience. Yeah. Because that was the whole thing, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, he's creating trust and a bond with the audience because he's basically putting out all of his crap. Yeah. Right there on show for him unexpectedly because they weren't expecting that but and nor was the other guy and then yeah. all of a sudden they're like wait what and then he hits him with bombs too after that and then they're just like okay yeah <laughs> that was unexpected but i like it yeah, <laughs> yeah. but i i think like on our podcast too like we've done that a lot but mm-hmm. we know it wasn't like a methodical thing we weren't like hey let's go share no. all the bad stuff so that people will like us more or trust us more we've never done that no we've just kind of always felt like hey you know, when it comes to running a business, when it comes to running a podcast, when it comes to being a marketer, there's good shit and there's bad st- mm-hmm. shit, right? Mm-hmm. Like, well, that that was the point. That's why I brought up share it all therapy you know? sessions. I brought that up when we're live with them, and because I, I was reading this in the book, you know, this uh, authority authority communicators is what I wrote down here in my notes, at least, and that's where you know you can be the most authoritative communicator if you establish your credit or your trust sorry your expertise which are the credentials and then the trustworthiness is what you're talking about here Mm -hmm. so it's like the expertise is kind of like the unsaid that's just what's known about you and then this other thing we have the control to control our language and yeah i feel like naturally on the podcast we've i don't know what the heck it was that got us to start sharing a bunch of the stuff that wasn't working over I the think, years. I don't know. I feel <laughs> a like a couple years back, I think. We, I think with our podcast, a lot of it was just being vulnerable to our guests because when mm-hmm. we're vulnerable to our guests, they tend to open up to us a lot more. That's right. Part of like it. I think, yeah. I think that was the path that we went down was, and, and that was a little more methodical. We've had discussions about that yeah. in the past where we're like, you know, if we tell our guests that like we're struggling with this, or if we share like some sort of stat into our business, mm-hmm. or we share something that kind of opens us up a little bit, kind of shows, that like we're not perfect vulnerable we're vulnerable, mm-hmm. where, like we screw up a lot too when we start sharing that stuff with the guests we find that the guests tend to also in return really mm-hmm. open up to us that's right and so we were doing that early and then we started making our like therapy session episodes where we just kind of talked about what was going on in our business and i think that kind of those kinds of discussions just flowed into those too. Now yeah. it's just you and me having discussions about like, well, here's what didn't work and here's what did work and here's what I'm worried about right now, but here's what's going on that's good right now. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's I true. think it just sort of bled into those episodes a bit. Yeah. And and looking at this, it's like, wow, there's actually a lot of power in that. Yeah. And didn't realize that was, that was what makes a very effective, I guess, authority with communication and I mean, we can all do this. We all have mm-hmm. the ability to just show some of the some some of the the stuff that's not so pleasant, maybe, mm-hmm. but then back it up with with something that's like hugely beneficial. Yeah, and and that could be done in so many ways. And obviously, in sales conversations, it could be like, yeah, you're really expensive, but and I love that reset. That mm-hmm. like, but you know, we're gonna we're gonna do so much, all these cool things for you. Yeah, or we're second. But we're going to do harder. We're going to try harder. Yeah. You know, I think Avis, that was the thing he uh, referenced there. Yes, our, our podcast sponsorships are expensive, but we're going to get you in front of 500,000 people. Bam. That's good. <laughs> I like it. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing. There here. we go. There's, 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 <laughs> like there's part of the angle right there. <laughs> cool, man. Well, I mean, there was a lot there. So definitely action guides. I don't know if we, we already prompted you, but get, definitely get the action guides yeah. for this episode. You got a couple weeks at the time of this going live. Go to flowchartgroup.com, flowchartgroup.com, and plug in your email address when it asks you to. It's going to redirect you to our Facebook group at the same time. So you'll it's a twofer. Mm-hmm. So plug in your email address and uh, go do that at flowchartgroup.com. Yes, sir. Uh, what else? We got Easy Webinar, who we is do. graciously sponsoring this episode, as they have done for probably three-ish years now. Thank you, <laughs> Easy Webinar crew. And well, there's a reason. It's obviously because you guys love them yeah. too. So I know a lot of folks in our community are using Easy Webinar, and it, there's a reason why they've been growing and keep optimizing what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So if you're in the webinar game and you're not aware of these guys, you definitely just give them a peek. But if you're thinking about putting webinars into your biz, 
as another channel for marketing, sales, all that fun stuff. I mean, that's the one-stop shop that you need to have in your Rolodex. So there's an easywebinar.com slash hustle. They are giving you a big discount if you use that link right there. Yes. So if you go to easywebinar.com slash hustle, hustle and flowchart listeners get a percentage off sales. So definitely go to that link mm-hmm. when you go to buy easy webinar because you're going to get a discount. You will. Guaranteed. Yes. All right. And, uh, Pot Check hacker. us out on YouTube. Oh, I mean, yeah. Let's let's just go with all of them. We're all all the call to actions are about to begin. <laughs> yeah, let's just keep on just going. So, yeah, I mean, you're probably watching us. If you haven't, then go check us out on YouTube, uh, hustle and flowchart TV, and then hit the subscribe button. And that's yes. just going to help us give these give these great insights to more people. That's our goal is to put a bigger ripple effect to to impact many a people. Yeah, we got to define what many is for us, but it's a lot of people, and we're on a war path to to just spread i also learned that i could you could go into the 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 back end dashboard and actually see who is subscribed so oh on youtube on youtube Uh, there's actually a page where it'll show you like who is subscribed and it'll it'll show like the youtube usernames of all your recent subscribers reward folks so that's what i'm thinking like since we can see recent subscribers you can actually (laughs) go and like pick one at random and be like hey here's a gift Uh, and we could just like give stuff away to people who hit subscribe on youtube i like that a lot so i think we will incorporate that Definitely to be in the mix there. You gotta be a subscriber. Yeah. Hustle and flowchart.tv. Go find us on YouTube and those videos are becoming muy bien. Yes. There we're editing magic is is just excelling. And this isn't us tooting our own horns. We've got some awesome editors, Jacob and Eric, who are just like making really killer videos lately. So like the the YouTube game just keeps getting upped. And, uh, it's impressing us at least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, go check it out. And then Pod Hacker, of course, that's our flagship offer where we train anyone who wants to get trained and learn our processes around our podcast growing this as a brand a business and you know growth hacking it along the way to get to crazy download numbers not that crazy when you know the mechanisms though yeah and then uh and then of course how to make money across the whole thing and and i think we brush over this a lot with pod hacker too but like there's templates for everything. Dang right, there are. They're like literally, if you want an email to pitch a sponsor, we've written the email for you. You want a contract that you want your sponsor to sign, we wrote that for you too. True. You want a cold outreach to get a guest on your show, we wrote that for you. You want a thank you email for after somebody was on the show, done. We did that for you. You want to know how to um, like ask the right questions when somebody books into your show? Yeah, we already gave that to you as well. So like Podhacker, we basically gave you everything in a box. I don't want to call it a business in a box because not everybody's in it for the money. Right. But we've given you everything to just go. It's all in there. Yeah. Like virtual all of the box. documents, the emails, the templates, everything are just in Podhacker for you. So Podhacker's legit. Yeah. So go check it out. Podhacker.com. And uh, yeah, that's about that. <laughs> because about uh, that. there's a lot more than what we're saying, but we'll leave it right there. Yes, sir. Uh, other than that, share this episode. If you learned anything from this and i hope you did i'm pretty we just talked to robert cialdini if you didn't learn something from this episode (laughs) then uh you know you're probably like a chef that doesn't have anything to do with marketing or something i don't know you live in a box by yourself not not that that there's anything wrong with chefs i'm just saying maybe an episode about marketing wasn't the right one for you yeah but still you deal with people right or you probably should know about the principles. Yeah, you might not want to be so, influenced, so easily exactly. influenced. So chefs, always, welcome. Always the flip side, right? <laughs> if it's created for folks like them, anyway. It's, consumers. That's, that's true. And creators. All right. So, <laughs> all that to say is share this around to anyone you think that would love what you just heard or watched. We would be extremely grateful and go tell people about it and uh, let them know. Or let, let us know that you're doing this and we'll hook you up with something cool, too. For sure. Always want to help the folks that are helping us out. So Sweet. thank you very much. This is a fun time. We'll do it again soon. Boom.